Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. Thank you for joining us today. These webinars are designed to correspond with what's growing in your garden and what's for sale from local farmers. With the harvest season well underway here in Maine, we've got your answers for how to preserve these foods safely. Our webinars provide guidance according to current USDA recommendations for preserving food at home. I'm Lisa Fishman, and we will also be joined today by my other colleagues, Kathy Savoy and Kate McCarty in the demo kitchen. The University of Maine Cooperative Extension has a mission to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based education and knowledge focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, horticulture, including master gardeners, 4-H youth development, food safety, nutrition, and of course, food preservation. Today, we're focusing on all the different ways you can preserve apples. From canning and freezing to drying and root cellaring, apples can be preserved in many delicious ways. Some housekeeping. We have our webinar set up so that you can hear and see us, but we can't hear or see you. But we want to answer your questions, so please ask them as they come up for you through our presentation by using the question and answer feature, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thanks for joining us today. Now, let's get started. This month, farmers are bringing crates and crates of apples to Maine farmers markets. Cortland, Empire, John Gold, Macintosh, Zestar, Paula Red, these are all varieties that you will see at markets and growing in orchards. Some apples are better suited for fresh eating, while others are good for saucing. Some are uniquely suited for cider making, and yet other varieties are recommended for baking. Kate, when we get to the demo kitchen, will get a little bit more into the best apple varieties for making applesauce specifically. But for baking, my favorites include Cortland, Gravensteins, Gala, and Macintosh. Your local apple farmer will at, is well versed in which apples are best for different purposes. So if you're not sure, ask for some recommendations and they'll definitely steer you in the right direction of what to buy. We're gonna kick off a little bit of a poll because we wanna know what is your favorite way to preserve apples? Is it storing in the root cellar? Is it canning? Is it freezing? Is it dehydrating? Or do you have another way that you like to preserve your apples? If so, please share that in the Q&A box. We'll give you a few seconds to get your answers in and you can choose more than one. Great. About five more seconds. Hurry, hurry. Three, two, one. Great. All right, and we can see that most people like to can their apples, um, but not too far behind is the freezing. And I'm gonna pop into the Q&A box and find out, oh, I didn't see any other methods listed in the Q&A box. Um, so those are all great ways So we are going to touch on all of them, the canning, the freezing, the dehydrating, and the root cellaring piece. A little bit today, but in more depth at a future webinar. Terrific, terrific, terrific. Okay, so for best quality, we're gonna talk about how to store your apples. So we wanna store our apples at room temperature between 32 and 38 degrees Fahrenheit, preferably with a high humidity. Apples store very well in the refrigerator in a perforated or mesh bag so as to avoid trapping moisture. Or you can store them just loose in your crisper drawer. If you're looking to store a large quantity of apples, you want to be sure to select a variety that's known for its storage properties, meaning it's a late ripening or a winter variety. These will actually produce a better flavor after they've been in storage for a while. Store these apples in baskets or boxes lined with perforated plastic to help them retain their moisture. 
be sure to check the apples often for spoilage because the old expression, one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel, certainly holds true in this case. Another concern you want to be aware of with storing apples is that they do give off ethylene gas. Ethylene gas causes other produce to ripen and can cause other vegetables to become yellow, soften, or decay. So you want to store your apples separately from other types of produce in your root cellar. Again, we're going to be going further into more detail about winter storage and root cellaring in our winter storage webinar slated for October 6th. So tune into that one if you're keeping your apples throughout the long winter months. Now Kathy is going to share some tips on freezing and dehydrating apples, and then we'll get into the different ways that you can can apples. Thanks a bunch, Lisa. I just want to reiterate the importance of when storing fresh apples that you keep them in the refrigerator. That really is the best way to keep them for long term storage. Um, and I'd also like to talk a little bit today about freezing. And as our webinars have pointed out all season, freezing is really a very quick and economical way to preserve some of your favorite foods. Um, apples would need to be sliced first and then blanched and frozen. And then once they're frozen, they're ready to use in any of your baking projects. You can also very easily freeze applesauce instead of canning it. And we'd like to just remind you that apples are indeed one of those fruit that once peeled, um, they do oxidize. So you want to remember to use an ascorbic acid to prevent the darkening, which is the, the term for um, what we mean when we're talking about oxidizing, things will turn dark. Um, there is a commercial ascorbic acid product that's widely available. Its commercial name is Fruit Fresh, and it will prevent apples and those other fruit that do turn dark, like pears and peaches, from getting dark. You simply follow the directions that are listed on the product container to create a dip from the powdered ascorbic acid um, and water. And then as you're working with your apples, you just um, put them in that mixture to keep them from darkening. Uh, let's also point out that ascorbic acid is simply another name for vitamin C. So if you happen to have some vitamin C tablets at home, you can actually make your own um, anti-oxidizing dip by mixing six 500 milligrams of um, a vitamin C tablet crushed into and then dissolved in one gallon of water. So just to point out what those simple steps are to freezing apples, you would uh, first of all blanch, prepare your apples and then blanch your apples um, by slicing, putting those slices into boiling water for one and a half minutes and then cooling them in an ice bath and then packing those cooled blanched slices into freezer grade containers. And you can either cover them with a simple syrup or granulated sugar. Um, and you would wanna use a half a cup of sugar per four cups of sliced apples. And then follow the directions that we've been talking about um, throughout the growing season, which is to remember to label your bags or containers with the quantity of apple slices so that you can more easily use them when it's time to include them in a baking project. And you wanna to remember to, uh, for quality purposes, use your frozen fruit, your frozen apples, within eight to 12 months for best quality. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about drying. Um, apples are one of those fruit that do really dry well at home using an electric dehydrator. Um, it's a very successful project when working with young children. Um, it does end up with a product that kids love to eat. Um, and they also, uh, apple slices make for a great lightweight, portable and healthy snack. So you simply want to wash and slice the apples no more than a quarter inch thick. A mandolin is a great kitchen tool to use for this to get some nice uniform slices. Whether or not you uh, choose to peel the apples is up to you. You can dehydrate apples with the peel on. 
It will take a little bit longer, um, but it does add um, another nice texture and a pretty color to your finished product. So after slicing, you simply soak those apples in the ascorbic acid to prevent that browning or oxidizing that we've referred to, and then spread the drained slices on a dehydrator tray. And you wanna be mindful to not overlap the slices. And then you simply dry those at 140 degrees until the slices are dry, but you still want them to be leathery or pliable. So they still want to have a little bit of moisture in them. And this typically takes about four to six hours to complete. Um, if you're looking to add a little flavor and variety to your dehydrated apples, go ahead and add some of your favorite spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, or even a combination of like an apple um, pie mix. And um, add them right to the slices and they will give you a nice boost of flavor. We wanna mention that sugar is indeed optional. Remember that when you're dehydrating foods, you're going to actually have those natural sugars called fructose um, concentrate as the water is removed from the product. Um, so you can go ahead and skip adding sugar, um, particularly if you're using one of the sweeter varieties of apples. For my taste buds, I find that a dehydrated apple chip, if you will, has enough of that natural sugar present, so I don't ever add any added sugars to it. Um, when you're talking about how to store your dried apple slices, again, a lot of people like to call them apple chips, um, you wanna store them in an airtight container um, because they will absorb moisture from the air the humidity that's present in the air can get back into that product. So you wanna make sure and keep them in an airtight container and store them. Um, and dehydrated apples will keep for six to 12 months. Never a problem in my house. Um, I've always had eager people eating them before the six to 12 month time period has passed. We wanna once again remind you that on September 29th, we will um, take a deeper dive into dehydrating fruit, including how to make the very popular fruit leather products, which is a sheet of a dehydrated fruit puree, um, which is another great way to incorporate homemade applesauce into a product. So let's switch back to Lisa, who's going to start to talk a little bit more about the basics of canning apples, which we understand from our poll is a very popular thing amongst today's attendees. Lisa? Thank you, Kathy, indeed. So we are gonna talk about canning apples. And because apples are considered to be a high acid food, they have enough acid in them that they can be canned using a boiling water bath canner or the atmospheric steam canner. And we've covered the basics of using both of these methods in previous webinars. Um, you're gonna find, because apples are very popular, there's going to be a plethora of research-based recipes for apple products that include jams and jellies and the juice and the cider. Um, you can find recipes for sliced, um, spiced apples in syrup, applesauce, apple butter, chutney, and very popular apple pie filling. All of these products can be canned using either the atmospheric steam canner or the water bath canner, the boiling water bath canner. So I did mention apple pie filling and I need to take a little side note here because apple pie filling deserves a special discussion. So apple pie filling is thickened with a very unique ingredient when you're canning. If you're just cooking apple pie filling at home, this is not a problem. But when you're canning apple pie filling, um, there's an ingredient called clear gel that's a thickener that is made from a modified cornstarch. And this cornstarch doesn't separate upon heating like many other thickeners will do. So it helps to have this apple pie filling maintain its consistency over time. So some thickeners, once you put them in the boiling water bath, while they're sitting in storage, they may separate, they may become runny, they may become lumpy. 
clear gel makes it possible for none of that to happen. It's a very stable food starch. So while it may be a little difficult to source, it is the recommended thickener for canning any type of pie filling, not just apple pie filling. So um, we have some resources that you'll receive on where to source clear gel, but one of the uh, places that we have had success sourcing it is Berry Farm, B-A-R-R-Y Farm, berryfarm.com, and we have ordered from them. But please note, there are two different products that are marketed. One is the clear gel, and the other one is an instant clear gel. You don't want to use the instant clear gel. That product is used for um, items that are kept at room temperature, uh, that are cooked at room temperature, and we are looking at something that's going into the boiling water bath canner or in the atmospheric steam canner, and you want to be sure that you're using the regular clear gel, not the instant. So once you've uh, gone to the trouble of getting your clear gel, I have to say it's pretty awesome to be able to look in your pantry and have jars of pie filling ready to go. And who doesn't love apple pie? And who doesn't love it when apple pie is as simple as dumping a jar of filling into a pie shell? Pretty awesome stuff. Okay, so we're going to jump into question and answer time here and let's see what we've got. And I do have one question up here. And that question is, is it okay to steam blanch apples instead of boiling water blanching them? So I can field that question. Um, steam blanching, as it sounds, is um, using steam instead of water, boiling water, um, with your blanching pot. And steam, as you may know, is hotter than boiling water. Um, and I've referred to the So Easy to Preserve book, which we always include as one of our resources. And it does give advice for steam blanching that includes, it is okay to use for some vegetables. And it does not list fruit um, as being an okay thing to use a steam blancher for. Um, so recognize that blanching is an important step um, but it does appear that we would only want to use a boiling water blanch for our um, apple slices. Any other questions, Lisa? At this moment in time, oh, wait, I spoke too soon. They are popping in now. Okay. Um, someone asks, sorry if I missed this, but how long will dried apple slices, dried apples last if my family does not eat them uh, as soon as they were done? And the answer for that would be six to 12 months. Um, and like I said, that typically doesn't happen in my house, but uh, you can keep them for quality purposes up to six to 12 months. Excellent. And right now the box is empty. So we are going to go to the much anticipated demonstration in the kitchen. And we're gonna join up with Kate McCarty. Thank you. Hello everyone. So I'm going to show you how to can applesauce. So I went ahead and prepared the applesauce ahead of time. So I'll catch you up on all the steps I did to create uh, the applesauce. And then I'll demonstrate actually filling the jars and canning it. Um, so like uh, Lisa and Kathy told you, applesauce can be canned using a boiling water bath canner or an atmospheric steam canner because apples are a high acid food. So applesauce um, in my kitchen here today is made simply from apples. Um, Kathy picked up some from a local orchard. They are the Paula Red variety. Um, some other varieties that are great for making applesauce from include Macintosh, Ginger Gold, Gravenstein, Jonathan, Cortland, and Jersey Mac. Um, and that's just not only the flavor, but that some break down better than others. So they'll cook down quickly and become a sauce. Much like the Paula Red did, I didn't have to really do anything to, to break it down. I didn't use a masher or a food mill and you'll see how uh, much it broke down. Whereas others will hold their shape for longer, which will make them better for baking so that you don't end up with an applesauce pie, whereas you wanna maintain the individual pieces of fruit. Again, if you have any um, qualms or confusion around what to purchase, you can just talk to the man or woman that's growing them there because they are your, your expert in that, um, knowing which apple to use. So Kathy brought me about four and a half pounds of 
these Paula Reds, and it takes about three pounds to make a quart of applesauce. So I figured I had about three jars, three pint jars worth of applesauce. So I went ahead and prepared my jars in the boiling water bath canner. I washed them up, um, put them in the, the water that I then brought to a simmer. And so they're ready to go for my, for my warm applesauce. If you're going to can a whole canner load of pints, you'll need about uh, 14 pounds of apples. If you want to do quarts, so seven quarts will fit in your boiling water bath canner, you should purchase about 21 pounds of apples. And um, all that, those numbers will be found in the fact sheets that we send you in the email following today. So you'll have that information. And then you can mix together different varieties to get a more robust flavored applesauce. So uh, use about one to two pounds of tart apples and um, for every three pounds of sweeter fruit. I went with the one variety, uh, it was a little flat, so I did add a little bit of sugar. The sugar is just there for flavor um, because these apples are acidic, so the sugar plays no role other than flavor. Um, so that means that you could add as much or as little as you'd like. You can use the white sugar like I did, or honey or maple syrup or Splenda or Truvia, um, whatever brand or um, type of sweetener you want. It really is just there for flavor. So taste it before you go. If you're gonna can a whole canner load, you'll be disappointed to do all that work, can it, end up with something that maybe isn't as flavorful as you like. So make sure you taste it before you go to all this trouble of canning it. So I um, washed the apples, I peeled them, I created that ascorbic acid dip to maintain this um, nice bright color that it has. So I did a dip of six cups of water and two tablespoons of the ascorbic acid. And this does have a little bit of sugar added to it. It's one of the ingredients, yes. So if you are trying to avoid sugar completely, just know that the Fruit Fresh product already has some in it. So I made that ascorbic acid dip to put my peeled apples in while I worked um, and peeled them all up. Then I chopped them, cored them, and just put them in a pot with a splash of water. It's about a half a cup. Um, it was a little thick, so I did add another half a cup. So I did a total one cup of water. Um, and again, that's just so it gets to be the consistency you like. And then brought it to a boil and let it um, kind of simmer and do its thing. So as it starts to thicken, um, it will burp a lot. And I'm glad I had my video on mute earlier because I was shouting a little bit as I brought it, this applesauce to a boil to can and it was splattering on me. So you might want to use a splatter guard or just wear long sleeves or get a, um, a pot holder that is like a glove so you can stir safely because it did get me a little bit. Um, as it starts to thicken and boil. And make sure you stir it frequently because it will scorch on the bottom and then leave these unpleasant little burned bits throughout. So all this is in the name of getting you and your family a high quality applesauce that everybody is excited to enjoy. Mine broke down really nicely into sauce. If you want it really smooth, um, you could use a food mill. So this is a relatively inexpensive tool that um, lets you put chunkier applesauce in, turn this crank, and out the bottom comes a really finely milled um, applesauce. Gives you that nice smooth texture. You could also use an immersion or stick blender directly into the pot if you want. So that's all the work I did ahead of time to get this nice, delicious, smooth applesauce. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and can it. Again, I've got my pint jars going in the boiling water bath canner. It has a rack in the bottom. And at least an inch of water over the tops of the jars. That will rise up a little as I put the full jars back in, but I just wanted to make sure I had enough water since I'm doing a smaller batch. So I'm going to take all my jars out. Eh, I'm not. I'm going to do one at a time because applesauce can be a little finicky to get right. So I'm going to keep the rest of my warm jars in there. And I'm going to move my applesauce over here. I'm left-handed. And I have a few more fun tools to share with you today. So I have the uh, stainless steel funnel. So typically the one that comes in the canning kit is a uh, plastic. So if you're looking to avoid plastic in contact with hot food, you might want this stainless steel variety of the canning funnel. I found this sold separately at an independent hardware store. So just like any other high acid product, you'll ladle your applesauce into the jars until for this product you reach half an inch of headspace double checking on my so easy to preserve book here. Half an inch of headspace, so that means half an inch from the top of the jar. And we're gonna double check using our headspace measurer. So this is the plastic tool with the notches on the bottom that shows you, yes, the applesauce is half an inch from the top of the jar. 
And then the other end of it helps you get the bubbles out. So because applesauce is a thick product, you can have some trapped air in here. So do your best to kind of coax those bubbles up towards the bottom. You're not gonna get every single one out, but just try and get, target the big ones and double check your head space, half an inch, great. And then take a clean paper towel to wipe off the rim. Apply one lid. Make sure it's one, sometimes they stick together. And your screw band until it's fingertip tight. And last week I mentioned I have this cute little curved pot holder. So you can see it in action. It holds the pint while I tighten my lid or my screw band using only the strength of my fingers to get that on there tight. So again, these are sold separately from the canning kit. I've seen them on shelves occasionally, not widely available, but they can be found. And then back into the canner. I'll repeat this process once more for anyone who maybe was checking the internet in another window. I don't blame you. It happens to me while I'm on webinars. So you can see how nice and um, smooth this applesauce is when really I didn't have to use a blender, a stick blender, or a food mill, or even a potato masher. These Paula Reds just broke down really nicely. Great. Half an inch of headspace looks good. And not a lot of bubbles, which looks good too. Wonderful. All right, and wipe your jar rims. Apply one lid and screw band. So we'll repeat this process until all of our jars are filled. And like I mentioned um, last week, it's often nice. So if you get to the last jar and you can't meet the headspace, it's nice to have, this is an eight ounce jar. So it's half as much as the pint jar. You might be able to, uh, might have enough product to meet the headspace requirements in this um, half pint jar. And then you could safely process that in the, the same canner load as the pints. Um, we're going to process our applesauce and pints for 15 minutes at this altitude here at sea level. Um, and this, this jar would be okay to hang out in there as well. So once I finish filling all my jars, I'll put the heat or the lid back on my canner, turn the heat up, wait till the water returns to a full rolling boil. And then I will start my 15 minute timer um, for, pro for the processing time here at sea level. If you are canning at a higher elevation, you'll need to adjust for altitude. So your canner will, or your recipe will tell you how many additional minutes to add per um, extra feet you are above sea level. Um, and once that time is up, you'll turn the heat off on your canner, take the lid off, and wait an additional five minutes. So this is a, to allow the temperature to um, equalize. And it will be additionally important when you're processing applesauce. So because applesauce is a thick, starchy product, it sometimes is vulnerable to what's called siphoning in canning. And this is when um, liquid from inside the jar is pulled through the vacuum, siphoned um, out into the, to the environment. And so you, I actually have done, seen it in a, a class I taught once. It looked like applesauce lava flowing down the sides of the jars. Um, and so you'll lose your product. Um, that potentially could keep the seal from forming as now that rim is all gunked up from the applesauce there. Um, and it will disrupt the headspace. So it's something that you want to try and avoid. And that extra five minute cool down after your processing time will help you kind of help that um, temperature equalize between the internal environment of the canner and the relative cool of room temperature. I will say though, if you are canning and you do notice some liquid loss in your jars, um, we get a lot of calls from people who say, I measure my headspace and everything looked great, but then um, I let the jars cool and now I notice there's um, a loss of liquid, as long as the jar is sealed and it's not too extreme, so most of your food is still covered by that liquid, um, those jars are still safe to keep in storage. You just might want to eat those jars first when you go to take one down off the shelf. So take your jars out after the processing time and cool down. Let them cool completely on, I'm going to use this baking cooling rack again. Um, let them cool completely for the seals to form. Come back the next day, label and date them. 
um, with just a month in the year is fine and applesauce so that you know what it is and that you have um, a year to use it for best quality. And then once you're opening your applesauce, keep it in the fridge and try and enjoy it within two weeks uh, for best quality. And so if you do have some that either don't seal or if you are like, okay, Kate, this is too much work. I actually have no interest in canning applesauce. You could always freeze your applesauce. So this is a freezer grade pipe container. Just fill it up, leave a little bit of space at the top for the applesauce to expand. Or you can use those um, wide mouth pint jars that I was showing you. So those, these are jars that freeze well. If you're canning in these and you have one that doesn't seal, you can just pop it in the freezer as is if it was unsealed. Or you can just fill these up and leave headspace, um, put either the metal canning lid or the plastic storage cap on them and store it in the freezer. It's not recommended to freeze in these pint jars that have the shoulder, so the regular mouth pint, because they could um, crack in the freezer or even upon thawing. So go with the wide mouth pint. All right, that's it for canning applesauce, but I do wanna hear your questions, what I might have overlooked or left out or confused you by, so. Feel free to drop those in the Q&A box. And in the meantime, we're gonna go back to Lisa. Awesome, thanks for that great demonstration, Kate. That was great. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about what to do with some of this applesauce you've canned. If you're, I mean, you could always eat it just straight up as it is, but you might wanna be a little more creative and do something different with your applesauce. Um, one great way to use applesauce is to substitute it for some of the fats and oils in some of the baked goods that you make. So consider this, a cup of unsweetened applesauce has 100 calories and a cup of oil has 1,985 calories. If you could substitute part of the oil or fat in your baked goods with some applesauce, you would be well on your way to reducing the total calories and total fat in your baked goods. So that's a win-win all around. So you can use applesauce or any other fruit puree for half of the fat called for in a recipe. You may need to reduce your baking time a little bit, maybe by 25%. So for example, if the recipe calls for a cup of fat or oil, use a half a cup of fat or oil and a half a cup of applesauce. I have a favorite carrot cake recipe that calls for a cup of oil and I just simply replaced half the oil with a half a cup of applesauce and a half a cup of oil and it's worked out great. You can see this pumpkin and squash bread recipe that's up on the screen now. Um, you can definitely use the puree, there's a pumpkin puree or squash puree that you can substitute in there and it's healthier for you, it tastes wonderful and nobody would know that you snuck in some healthy high fiber goodies in there. So we're gonna head back to Kathy now and Kathy is going to talk a little bit about cider. This time of the year, yeah, I'm all about the cider. Take it away, Kathy. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so with an October birthday, I can I have fond memories of a cider and fresh homemade donuts at my birthday party. Um, so cider making is something that is always of interest to me. Um, pressing cider is a really fun um, and a traditional fall family activity uh, with COVID-19 um, part of our lives now. This could be a fun way to get outside and enjoy doing something as a family. Um, Want to pass on a few of our food safety tips if you indeed are preparing to press your own cider at home. So it is important to wash the apples ahead of time with clean water to remove any debris um, that could be on those apples just before grinding them. And you wanna make sure that the cloths and the racks that are used as part of the cider press are clean and kept off of the floor during batches. Um, cleaned and sanitized is also another thing we want to make sure all of the cider pressing equipment, um, how that's being handled. 
And um, remember that you can blend a variety of apples to come up with um, a different level of sweetness. Um, I've also seen people press both pears and apples at the same time to come up with a nice combination um, of pressed fruit. Really tastes good. Um, remember, like with all of our foods, we want to make sure that foods are finding their way into um, what we call food grade containers. Um, we wouldn't want to use some recycled, um, let's say, joint compound buckets if we were um, pressing cider. We would want to make sure that our cider is getting put into a food grade plastic or stainless steel container. And um, Several years ago, the recommendation changed and now includes that you should be um, heating your cider to 155 degrees for 10 seconds prior to consuming. And why, you might be asking, and that is to prevent foodborne illness that can be associated with ciders. So it is a way to flash pasteurize your product and really minimize your risk for those foodborne illnesses. Once you have your cider pressed, you want to make sure and store it at 40 degrees or lower. Um, and if you are going to bottle it, remember to bottle it in cleaned and sanitized containers as soon as it is pressed. And just some real basic don'ts. And they include, of course, do not use any apples that are spoiled, moldy, um, and do not use drops. And why? That's because um, our orchards are shared with um, a lot of animals that may roam around the orchard eating the drops, and they may also be dropping some of their own matter that we do not want to get into our press cider. So again, do not use drops for cider pressing. And you want to uh, limit the exposure of your press cider to the air and to insects. Um, I know several times that I've been pressing cider, we've had um, bees that like to join the party as well. So just be aware of that. They're drawn to the sweetness and um, minimize the exposure of the cider to insects and air. Um, and remember, just like with all foods, you wanna make sure that the cider is not at room temperature for any longer than two hours. So make sure you're working in a, a batch that's the volume that you can get into a cooler temperature. And again, that's 40 degrees or lower um, within the two hours. So I want to um, look to see, first of all, if we've got um, a lot of questions in our Q&A box. And we don't seem to have too many that have been added. So we're gonna go ahead and um, show you a video that our FNIP colleagues have created to show you how to use fresh apples. So we'll go ahead and let that roll.
thanks again to our FNEP colleagues for that great video. And if you're looking for more, you can check out their Mainly Dish um, website and get lots of great recipes. Um, I want to, I, I don't think we have any questions in our Q&A box, but I do want to back up and say I did a little homework on that question that was asked about steam blanching of the apples. And I did correct myself in the Q&A box, but I want to make sure and do that so all of you can hear that it is okay to go ahead and steam blanch apple slices if you wish to. Any other questions in the Q&A box, Lisa? Yes, we have quite a few. Um, we have someone, if you have any recommendations on what to do with the apple skins, if you choose to peel your apples. Well, I know whenever I've had chickens in the backyard, they've enjoyed getting those as a nice snack. <laughs> um, beyond that, I'm not really sure. Do you have any ideas, Lisa or Kate? Yeah, you can make a great jelly. Um, by processing the peels and um, working that way. So that's one option. Um, Kate, do you have any other ideas? No, I was going to say compost. <laughs> but I appreciate <laughs> their uh, dedication to the no waste kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, other questions that have come up is could you repeat again what the apple variety is that you were using for the applesauce? Those were Paula Reds and they were purchased at a local apple orchard that I visited just this morning. And the apple orchard was far busier than I thought it would be this time of year. Um, and Paula Reds were the only variety that they had out so far. Um, so they have a big long list of other varieties that will be coming soon. Right. And I do know that up here in Aroostook County where I'm from, uh, Zestar is what's currently being harvested in the orchards up this way. Nice early apples. More questions. Um, did you sterilize the lids, Kate? I did not. So all I did was wash them up and put them aside until I was ready to use them. So um, that is all that's recommended. There used to be the recommendation that you needed to simmer them in a small pot of water. And they had a magnetic lid lifter, which I just saw go by. This lid lifter, which would help you get one warm lid out of that little pot of water. But um, the manufacturer of these lids, Ball, has since dropped that recommendation. So you don't need to heat them up. And then as far as sterilizing, because the applesauce is being boiled for 15 minutes in our boiling water bath canner, you don't need to sterilize your jars either um, because that will happen during the processing time as jars are boiled for 10 minutes to be sterilized. So the 15 minutes of processing for the applesauce takes care of that as well. So they're really streamlining it for us, which we appreciate. <laughs> Super. That's all the time we have for questions and answers right now. Um, but we do make a um, commitment to following up with any of you who have asked questions. We have a running tally of those questions and your email addresses. So we will get back to you and answer your questions. Um, but we do want to let you know that uh, we do have this list of recommended resources. And you will get these resources uh, that will be included in a follow-up email. One of our featured resources is the main heirloom apple guide, which is published this year by the author of the Portland Food Map. It is a detailed guide of Maine apple orchards and all of the varieties they offer and some tasting notes. We'll also share with you an interactive directory of Maine farm products that our UMaine agriculture colleagues have created and that'll help you shop directly at farms. Be sure to visit the farm's websites first or call ahead so you can learn about how their policies may have changed during COVID-19. And don't forget about our Preserving Coach program. These are UMaine Extension trained master food preserver volunteers. So unlike some of the um, information you may find on the internet, um, these folks are a group of people who are trained to follow the USDA recommendations for home canning. So they are someone that we can pair you up with um, as we extend our way to the end of the growing season and they can provide advice by phone, email, or Zoom. So we do still have a handful of people that are looking to um, find folks to answer their questions for. So give Kate McCarty an email um, if you'd like to be matched up with someone. Now next week we'll be back on Tuesday at two 
to discuss pressure canning, soups, and stocks. Other topics for September will include fermenting vegetables and dehydrating fruits and vegetables. Then in October, we'll get further into the winter storage, also known as root cellaring, of a variety of fruits and vegetables. Be on the lookout for an email later on today with upcoming registrations, resources, and recipes from today's topic, as well as information on how to be paired with a preserving coach. We'll also share a link to an evaluation and certificate of completion. Complete our evaluation and, we'll prov and provide your US mailing address and we'll send you a free Headspace tool that Kate was using today with the applesauce. And we thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day.